Thank you very much. It's, uh, it's hot in here, so I took the liberty of just wearing a t-shirt. So not the corporate uh, shirt, but just a t-shirt. But um, I'm happy to be back. Thank you for the introduction, Stefan. It's good to be back. It's fun to be on this side uh, of the aisle and not on the other side. And I'm happy for two reasons. I'm happy to see all of you guys prioritizing this. I know most of you have had a, a long day already. There's some football on the TV as well. Um, I'm also happy that I have my voice back, um, and that's why I'm sucking on some fishermen, because I was out on the stadium cheering and roaring and, and uh, shouting as well for, for the Danish team. They played a very important match yesterday. How many of you guys are into football? To show of hands. Just a few. I hope it's okay that I just bring a short story uh, on the football side, on the experience of uh, yeah, my yesterday evening. Because it was just fun to see 10 years on how much has happened on, um, on the whole football experience. You know, the door to door, to door, to door for, for the journey, for the whole ticketing, uh, for the experience and coming back. So 10 years ago, uh, when I went to a football match, it would be, you need to, if you were lucky, you could order the, the ticket online. Sometimes you even had to go to the physical shop. You would get a paper ticket. They would sort of rip it apart like, or, or some part of it when you had to enter into the arena, just like when you go to the cinemas uh, in the old days. So I was just wondering, quite a lot has happened within those 10 years. I mean, just in that process or in that journey, that experience, a lot has been digitalized. So I was just thinking, what has actually happened? So yesterday, I was out with uh, two friends and uh, my sister. We had a WhatsApp group. WhatsApp was not there 10 years ago. We were just uh, discussing what time should we meet. One of my friends came over, um, and then we, we had to drive to the, to the arena. I, I called uh, my sister up two minutes before. We have a Mercedes. So I could just say, hey, Mercedes, just like, hey, Siri, can you just please call up sis? I called her up and said, hey, we're here in two minutes. Can you come out? So another digital sort of uh, engagement there. When uh, she came in the car, our last friend was waiting uh, at the stadium. Of course, I wanted to make sure that we took the fastest route, so I used Waze, or actually it was Google Maps yesterday, to get sort of a real-time uh, traffic situation on my way to the stadium. And uh, that was good, because I was not the only one driving in there. Um, it's a working night, so not too many beers, of course. Um, so that was good, another digital engagement. I found uh, a parking space use the Easy Park app to, uh, to you know, um, for, for the time I needed the parking for. Another digital engagement. We walked uh, to, towards the stadium. Uh, we had our Danish Dynamite uh, t-shirt on, red and white, and so did the rest of the crowd over there. So it was a little bit difficult to find my, my last friend. Um, he was so kind enough to do a, a Google pin drop so one minute after, we were able to, to find him, which was good. We had the tickets. I had it on my phone for all four of us. It was an app we downloaded for UEFA 2020. And um, there I had already put the, the personal information. And, and actually, I could choose to transfer the tickets to, to my friends or just keep them. But as we were together, I had all of them on my phone. Then we came to the first stage gate, you could say. There are three stage gates to get into the actual arena. Um, the first stage gate was to be checked that we had a um, corona passport, that we had a negative test for, for corona or had gotten the, the vaccine uh, 14 days after. And they, there we had the app Meet Sunhill, where we could uh, download the, the corona passport uh, and showcase that we're all good to, to go in and cheer uh, and shout. <clears throat> The next stage was uh, we knew that there might be a potential that we had to show our personal ID. And today, we can actually also just download uh, your driving license on the phone as well. So still no physical paper uh, in this instance. Then we had to showcase uh, the first time we had to showcase the tickets. They had a scanner. They, um, we didn't even need to swipe the QR code or anything at that moment. They just swipe. How many are you for? OK, come through. And it was actually pretty, pretty optimized, the whole, the whole process. One problem, we were only three who came through. The fourth one didn't come through because he met us uh, in the center. He came directly from work. And he had a bag that was too big that uh, wafer doesn't permit to come in because they don't know what you might have. You might throw it or something. Uh, so he was not allowed to come in. 
and I had already gone on the other side. So uh, then what? But then they said, you know what, we'll just reactivate your, your two tickets so you can go out again. It was all done in a digital manner again. So went out, I went out, we went back to the car, put the bag there, went back, and then did the same thing, had to show the Corona Pass and show the, the tickets again. The last instance was going to the actual arena. Then we, um, then we had to swipe, and that wasn't not too uh, sufficient. There's, uh, there's room for improvement, let's say that. And uh, every time it was like going to a roller coaster ride, you had to, you had to sort of scan or, or your boarding pass when, when going through the security. Um, you had to scan, and then you had to swipe for each one of them. But all in all, long story short, it was just that experience from 10 years ago to yesterday evening just to see the digital journey, the digital transformation, just in a user experience of going to a football match. For me, that was pretty thought-provoking and, and sort of an epiphany. Then what will happen in 10 years? If we do the same exercise, and if I try to do the same thinking exercise, what digital integration will we have? Maybe it will be something about, you know, they will have some heat flow maps to see where the crowd is moving so they can direct people to, you know, where gates where there are less people where they can sort of staff up on the popcorns and beers and, uh, and refreshments uh, again. The toilets, uh, because there were long queues at the toilets still during halftime, peak times. Maybe there's still room for some improvements in 10 years from now. That was a long football story. We're not here to only talk about football. So allow me to introduce myself. And I'm going to switch the, to the presentation right here. Good. So today's topic is digital transformation. It's about applying data and analytics with a personal twist. I like to, to bring in some personal anecdotes as well. Uh, I would also love to hear some, some stories from, from your end. So let's maybe try to have a dialogue, not just the one-way communication. I will definitely engage and activate you during the exercise. And then we'll swap the roles. Will you be presenting to me and to the rest of us? A little bit about myself if I can get this to work. Good. So my name is Amit. Uh, Stefan already introduced me. I am an engineer from DTU. Uh, I graduated in 2005 within informatics. It was a lot of programming, lots of maths, but I had a more desire on on the sort of uh, other type of topics such as starting your own business. How do you um, how do you, the more commercial uh, side of business. So, so I was more into these uh, courses here at DTU, at the end at least. I, uh, I supplemented my engineering degree with uh, an, uh, what's called an HD, a business degree from, from CBS, Copenhagen Business School. And that was within uh, financial management and process leadership. And then, as uh, Stefan also said, I was also a part of the executive MBA program here at DTU which I completed in 2011. 13 it actually was, 13. I started in 11 and then uh, completed in 2013 as part of MMT class 14. And for me, that was a breaking point taking the executive MBA. I'm not being paid by Stefan to say this, but uh, in fact, it was a breaking point for me in my professional life. There was a lot of dedication. I mean, there was a lot of sort of uh, sacrificing being done, but I would do it all over again if I had the chance. So those of you who are either finishing soon, you know, it's just starting. This is where you need to apply it in, in real life, not just uh, theoretically. And those who are maybe looking into taking an executive MBA, I would definitely recommend the DTU one because you, you both have the technical flair, you have the international flair, and they bring in some really, really cool uh, uh, people for, for presenting the different uh, topics on the program. I leveraged the MBA to, to start my own business. So I have uh, 20 years of experience within the data analytics experience, starting from BI, then more into analytics, starting my career in a company called NNIT, and when OS IT was called back in the days. And as part of the MBA, I had a desire, you know, I wanted to start my own. Could have probably climbed the corporate ladder in the corporation that I was, and uh, I just had the desire to sort of uh, having realizing my entrepreneurial dreams. And um, that was possible after taking the executive MBA. So two months before I graduated, I quit my job at the time, and I started IntelliShore, that I'm still heading up today. We are two founders of IntelliShore. 
And in Tennis Show at that time, the, the vision, the ambition was to bridge the gap between the Nordics and India. I have Indian origin. I'm born here in Denmark. And IT outsourcing was, uh, was hot. Everything was in India at that time. We felt we had an ability to being able to understand the Danish clients, the Nordic clients, but also having some extra sort of cultural heritage to activate a high-performing team in India. Fast forward, we do nothing between Denmark and India today. We bridge the gap between strategy and technology, between business and IT, between people and data. So we're a company who help uh, clients, customers, companies with their, with their digital transformation journeys. And I'll also bring some of the stories, uh, that uh, some war stories from the clients, not the confidential ones, of course. Yes, so today IntelliShow is a company of uh, 30 plus companies, uh, people, and uh, we work with a number of companies that are listed up here. And uh, I'll tell you a little bit about uh, some, of, uh, some of the areas that we work with in, in just a minute. I am also an investor now, business angel investor in, in four startups. Um, you know, the common denominator being, uh, being data driven. Uh, that, that's sort of my ambition. How can we take information into data uh, or, or data into information into insights that we can take action on? That, that's the journey that I like. Uh, and that's why the companies that I've invested in have sort of a data insight element. One of them being Cerebro, who do uh, MI, uh, MR scannings of the brain to detect if you have any uh, tumors in the brain that could advance to cancer, for example. And the interesting is that sort of pivoted uh, as well to scan lungs to see how severe people who have been hit by COVID-19 how severe uh, will it develop into, what you need to be hospitalized, what you need a ventilator, and that's all for good reasons to, to optimize the logistical uh, situation, whether we have a lot of uh, patients in, in certain parts of, uh, of Denmark, for example. So, so really interesting companies. I'm also part of a venture capital fund called uh, Nordic Eye, where we uh, invested in, in 17 companies, um, so also interesting there. Enough about me. Today's agenda. So we'll be going through on how to apply data analytics. We'll have a breakout session, and then we'll have a presentation. And we'll, I'll ensure we have some breaks uh, in between so you can fill up, uh, fill up with some refreshments. But we'll have three, three, we'll have three key uh, purposes of the session today. I hope you, you will get sort of a, a company leader perspective on how organizations build ca uh, digital capabilities. I hope you get a view into how to distinguish between large and small organization, what the hurdles are for them, what the commonalities are. And finally, also to provide some hands-on, so it's not just theory, but how do we apply it into successfully prioritizing these digital initiatives that I'll introduce to you today. All right, so how many of you believe that digitalization is going to eliminate a lot of jobs? Just a show of hands. And I already clicked it, so that was not so good. But now it's working. No one? A few? And how many believe that it will uh, create some jobs? Now you already saw the results. Good choice. But actually, both of you are right. Because, I need to click the right way. Gartner, Gartner is a sort of an analytical institution. They predict that by 2025, Within AI and ML alone, a 1.8 million jobs will sort of be diminished, will be lost. On the other hand, 3.8 million jobs will be created. So there's a positive of a delta. You can say, you know, 2 million jobs uh, out of, you know, how many jobs there are in the global space might, might not be too much, but if we're just digging in AI, ML, so artificial intelligence that's replacing human uh, jobs, processes, then it's actually pretty okay just within the next few years. I think this number will grow as we, we go along. There's always a perception that when we are digitalizing, when we're automating, the jobs will be lost. I'm just taking one example up here. When, uh, when the tractor was introduced in, back in 1892 by John Frolick, then just taking a, some of those articles in, in the New York Times, 
So there seems to be sort of a hype every 30 years that, oh no, we're going to lose our jobs. Uh, in 1928, they ran an article saying, a march of the machine makes idle hands. Again, in 56, they had another article saying, robot revolution depriving them of jobs, the workers. And now latest in 2017, we have something, now it's not only your jobs that will be deprived or lost, now it's your children's jobs. So there's always sort of a, a perception versus reality, just like when I asked you to raise your hands, whether you believe jobs will be lost or there will be sort of a, a positive effect of digitalization. A lot of roles has also uh, emerged when, uh, when talking about digitalization. I remember doing this exercise uh, five years ago. Then, uh, then I put a role up there called Chief Digital Officer or Chief Data Officer. That's actually pretty normal today. Five years ago, it wasn't. So what roles can we expect in the future? There might be a role called Head of Organizational Disruption. We see in uh, more and more organizations, uh, they're starting up digital incubators. They are sort of buying innovation labs or taking it in or at least collaborating. So there's sort of a need or we see a tendency of larger corporations, especially saying we need to have that disruption. We need to see what the small agile companies are doing and how do we sort of reflect that in our big corporation? Should we have a head of disruption organization or disruption in, in the company? Another role could be chief trust officer, not only with the GDPR requirements coming in, but is that a role that will be in the future? Maybe now, uh, maybe in a few years. But that's also something to think about. We see more and more uh, sort of uh, dilemmas regarding how much of the data can we leverage, how much can we sort of protect, how much should we make accessible to the public. Robot human interaction counselor. Uh, a very long title, so not sufficiently that one, but, uh, but could that be a future role? Maybe not that exact title. Can you still hear me? Maybe not that uh, exact title, but, um, but do we see, we see more and more mach machines, not only mechanical, but also digital machines, and uh, could there sort of be a, a role for humans interacting in that sphere as well? I think the microphone went away. <clears throat> Maybe the battery. I'll just speak a little. Is it back? It's back. Let's go. A tech ethicist is closely related to the chief trust officer as well. Is that a future role that we will see? And maybe another example, head of immersive workplaces. Uh, we see more digital agents in organizations. In fact, one, um, one company <clears throat> that's part of the portfolio at Nordic Eye that I was speaking about, the venture fund or venture capital, they have a, a company called Air Help. So uh, when your flight, if you're flying these days, <laughs> when your flight is delayed or, or canceled, you can uh, request for compensation and they have sort of digital agents that, that do it for you. And uh, they have even named their digital agents Charlie and Anna and so on to give them a personal ID. And they're part of their org charts as well. So do we need sort of a, a head of immersive uh, workplaces as well, also with the VR, AR uh, emerging uh, in the organizations? So just to get a little bit thought-provoking as well, I'm not saying that this will happen, but we are seeing sort of a, a shift in new roles um, in organizations. A little bit of data. I am the data nerd uh, as well, so I'd like to share some data. So up here it says the digital revolution necessitates the development of new capabilities. What's interesting to see here is uh, a lot of employees, they say that, um, well, 94% said it's absolutely critical that we have data for our decision making about our customers. And on the other hand, 15% have said, well, we, we don't have the necessary data available. So there's quite the gap over there between reality and the sort of appliance of data. I took two quotes in as well that I thought was interesting uh, from, from our clients. And one of them says, the real challenge for us isn't developing new algorithms or tools. It's in how we can implement the culture and mindset change to get them to use and scale across the organization. So really about the softer parts, not so much about the technical capabilities or, or the more harder uh, technology aspects, which I find really interesting. 
Another one says our business leaders are talking about the vision, AI, customer experience, industry 4.0. But we don't really know how to make it more actionable. How can we have, what do we do tomorrow? And that is something that you'll also be doing. How do we actually do a strategy? How do we prioritize? How do we do a digital transformation? How do we select and deselect? One framework that we use in IntelliShop when we consult uh, our uh, clients is what we call the digital transformation, digital capability, or even data maturity curve. It's uh, been inspired by, by Gartner. It's all about being going from being reactive to proactive. All companies we see, they're, they're racing off for the holy grail. How can we go up to using and applying AI, machine learning, predictors, prescriptive, and rather not just being reactive? How can we predict if an incident is going to occur and avoid it? Instead of saying, why did it occur? Why didn't we sell as much as uh, we were supposed to as we thought? Why are we so much off of our budget? Could we have predicted COVID-19? Probably not. But uh, we saw some factors that, that could have been equipped us to being more ready. So, so this is actually um, what we see, almost a race. And I think what we need to appreciate is companies are at different levels of the maturity curve here. They can also be at multiple stages of the uh, maturity curve. Some departments will be working with Excel and, you know, uh, almost silo-oriented, and some are more predictive in their nature, or we're working with quite uh, statistical, uh, you know, complicated models uh, in their business uh, on an ongoing basis. So companies can be at multiple stages in, in, on the maturity curve. So we've talked to about 30 companies about leveraging data and analytics and uh, local companies here in, here in Denmark. <clears throat> Some interesting insights came out of that. 28 out of the 30 companies, they said, well, we have digitalization as a key focus within our strategic agenda. So that's almost good. It's almost a given. It's almost free saying, yes, of course, we have it in our strategy. The question is, are you doing anything about it? What are you doing about it? Who is doing about it? When are you doing something about it? 18 out of 30, they say, we focus too much about acquisition of new technologies. Again what I said uh, previously, that it's, it's not only about technology and all the emerging uh, capabilities that we can almost buy out there, uh, platforms, um, tools, but how do we actually anchor it in the organization? Almost half, 16 out of 30, to say, well, we have allocated the resources. We, we know we put in our budget, but we don't know where to start tomorrow. What should we prioritize? Where should we start? How do we start? So we've identified five hurdles. One of the hurdles is the lacking focus and fragmentation of efforts. We see in a lot of organizations, there is the appetite to do, but it's been so far fragmented, there's not a clear plan. So it's almost silo-oriented. We see the traditional about unreliable data foundation, and that's almost a starting point. How can we sort of base our decision if our foundation is not in place. A third one, limited operational decision-making tools. So that's in the consumption layer. So the people who are supposed to be, you know, driving better decision-making, if they don't have the tools or are not equipped to it, then we're not able to fulfill our digital transformation as well. A fourth one, insufficient investments to change culture and skills. There's almost a longer lead time to upskill our organization compared to all the new technology stuff that's coming out on the market. How do we follow that race? How do we change the culture as well? How do we upskill? How do we train them? How do we educate them? The last one is a disconnect between analytics, uh, sense of excellence, or IT, and the business. So we have also seen a lot of, you know, the efforts being driven by IT, but the value or the use cases is within the business and they know their processes better than IT. So we see a disconnect as well. It'll be fun just for you guys to, uh, to sort of state which of these five hurdles do you see in your business. And uh, if you can go to Menti, all of you on your phone, I'll just uh, switch the screen right here. So you have these uh, five hurdles, and if you choose which ones are applicable in your organization, please use the code. Oh, it's not there. 
uh, it's only on my screen, so what do I do? So even though I've talked about digital capabilities, we can still experience IT problems. Great. So if you could choose from, from those five hurdles, you're allowed to choose one, you're allowed to choose five if you want to. Which ones are applicable in your organization? And then I'll try to, to refresh it. I'll, did you guys get the code? Uh, it's just generating the code. Interesting. Does anyone want to share what they've selected? It'll be interesting just to hear from, from uh, your side as well. Anyone? Is there anything missing up there that you would have liked as a hurdle? ask you which company it is. So. <laughs> there was a comment over here, a raise of hands. Anyone else wants to share what they chose? Is that going on in your organization as well? So a little bit related to your, you know, the perception was actually true. Yeah. 
Great, good comments. Let me just go back to the presentation. If we just take the, the general statistics, there the biggest one is actually the last one. So the disconnect between uh, IT and business and uh, probably relates to some of what you also just mentioned that, uh, you know, we have a technical depth, uh, a tech depth. Um, there's a perception of what's reality versus the facts <laughs> uh, or, you know, the fake news that's going on. Um, what should we actually do? So that's just interesting to see comparing it with the results that you have. So here I want to introduce sort of five disciplines to mature with the digital transformation. And we'll go in depth with at least two of them. But um, one of them, when the McKinsey's, the BCG's, and, and, and so on have come in and made a corporate strategy, a 2025 strategy, you need to be more cost efficient, you need to penetrate new markets or, or whatever it may be, uh, we need to have digital transformation. What does that actually mean? So that's what we need to double click. Uh, also in this session. What does that actually mean to be more data-driven as an organization? Uh, it sounds good, but what does it mean? So that's the area, how to sort of articulate, turning a vision into action is what uh, lies in, in 001. Uh, doing analytic strategies, so doing a maturity assessment on your platforms, your processes, your people, the three Ps that we also call. That's the key, and where do we want to be? How do we make a roadmap for that, an actionable roadmap? Area two, sustaining a healthy uh, data platform. So that is basically your data journey, making those data pipelines from ingestion to, to consumption, almost your, your data uh, birth uh, from, from cradle to, to grave, perhaps. Um, what do we need to do? Are we going at a cloud strategy, multi-cloud or on-premise? Do we need a data warehouse? How are we enriching the data? How are we harmonizing? How are we presenting the data? The third area is delivering decision-making tools. So again, uh, how do we visualize the data? How do we present the data to the people who are going to consume data for better decision-making? A fourth area, uh, embedding a data-driven culture. So that is really about the capabilities. How do we change the ways of working? How do we train, upskill, drive the data literacy in organization? So the more cultural aspect uh, of the equation here. A last area is uh, really related to the whole AI, uh, ML uh, discipline is operationalizing data scientists or data science. Usually we see emerging data scientists uh, in, in different companies, uh, you know, those who are coding in R or Python or, or, or such, uh, having some PhD in statistics, uh, making these prediction models. So, but two areas that I want to cover for, for today is 001, so what we call turning vision into action. So the analytical strategies, digital capabilities, how do we actually do digital transformation, and the cultural set uh, of it as well, the 004 area. Good. In a moment, I'll introduce an exercise for, for you guys. And you'll get lots of printouts, so uh, in a moment there'll be quite a text-heavy uh, slide. It's not uh, intentional that you read everything now, because you will have time out in the, the group work uh, to, to digest and to, to build your own digital transformation roadmap. Exciting. What I'll introduce now, uh, very shortly, are 12 initiatives that help you drive digital transformation. We sort of group them into these four categories. One we call competency assessment and gap fit analysis. So do we have the right competency? Do we have the right change, the sense of urgency? Do we, do we need to have the capabilities in-house or externally? How do we sort of plan our capability development? That resides in this group here. Then we have another group that we call efficient and purpose-driven ways of working. Do we need sort of recipe books or playbooks that sort of say, if we have a digital requirement, how do we sort of drive it to, you know, go live, hypercare, and so on? Is that what we need? So exact recipe books to drive digital transformation. Another one could be, you know, user adoption. How do we get users to adopt to those new digital solutions? Is that the important part in our organization? The third dimension, you could say, is governance and operating model. Do we need to have sort of an operating model and a drumbeat? How do we build communities across uh, so we don't work in silos? What's the governance models and principles that we adhere to in our, our organization? The fourth dimension is driving cultural change. So do we need a standard uh, approach for driving change uh, in the organization? 
How do we enable self-learning in the organization? How do we roll out new solutions? Some of them are intentionally a little bit overlapping. You will figure that out when we, when we go out for, for the exercise. You shouldn't uh, read them right now, but you will get the time to, to read them in depth, all these 12 initiatives. This is just a short introduction for, for now. Because let's just start by looking at some of the characteristics of a multinational company, a bigger corporation versus a small medium enterprises. So I've taken two examples uh, uh, later on for, for the exercise. Let's just discuss what are the enablers and challenges. Well, we've seen at least enablers for digital transformation in larger corporations. Is there's actually a really broad set of competencies. They have the budget, which is good when you're driving a consultancy business uh, as mine. But they also have a really, really broad techno, the tech suite. That can be good. That could also be bad, because then they have multiple tools for the same reporting purposes or digital purposes. What we see as challenges is the bureaucracy. There is a typical also an organizational complexity. There's an establishment, uh, sometimes uh, there's multiple establishment of strategic direction. It's not just one way, but it can actually go many ways in larger corporations. If we look at the small medium enterprise, then we usually have uh, one of the enablers is we have the top level involvement, which is really, really good. So there's a mandate, there's a more clear direction sometimes. It doesn't get uh, drowned uh, when we come further down in the organization. Thereby, we also have faster decision making, and we have already a thought process, a mindset of uh, digital ways of working from day one. The challenges we see are constrained resources, lack of capabilities because we don't have the volume. I wouldn't call it maybe poor IT systems, but more less mature <laughs> IT system, not as governed, not as mature as we see in the big organizations. So these are just some of the characteristics that we see uh, comparing uh, the multinationals and the small, medium-sized companies. So an exercise that you guys will be doing, and I'll divide you in groups in just a minute. I will, how many are we around 20-something? I'll divide you in, uh, in four groups. So two groups, they'll be working on uh, a large corporation. In this case, it'll be Noah Nordisk. And then two of groups, they'll be working for uh, a small medium enterprise, in this case, Joe and the Juice. And there are different stages on their data maturity curve. Remember the one I presented uh, in, in the beginning? So for case one, the characteristics of Novo Nordisk, they have a, a solution that they've built. Uh, they have a CRM system. Now they're building some reporting capabilities on top that they're rolling out to 30 affiliates um, that, uh, that they need to use for, for better decision making. What's another characteristic is they have varying uh, parties and uh, different systems across those locations, those affiliates. And you're dealing with about 50 stakeholders in the organization. Their wish or their desire, ambition, is to move from what we call guided analytics uh, into more sort of the predictive modeling. The other case, so two of the teams that will be working with this, they are in a situation where there's one solution that's being rolled out to one country, you could say. And uh, they, are, um, they don't have a sort of a uni unified uh, space at the moment, and they have a limited uh, stakeholders that we're working with. We're a little bit in the beginning of uh, the data maturity curve, but, but that is where we want to sort of go, come up to some more self-service um, situation. Divide you up in just a minute. So the exercise here is to take all of those 12 initiatives and build a digital roadmap. You will have 12 weeks, uh, so to say, to, to build, and each initiative has a cost. At the end, you will uh, get your roadmap uh, and place your digital initiatives. So what would you priority, uh, prioritize with those initiatives that uh, you can go out and read more thoroughly? And don't get too overwhelmed with all the text that's written. That's just examples to give you, okay, what does that exactly mean? Uh, so you will see that on, on those specific initiatives that we will hand out to you as well. So the exercise is you will get a roadmap, you have 12 weeks. Each initiative has a cost. So you can't choose all of them, obviously. Uh, some of them cost two weeks. Some of them cost four or five weeks. But given the situation that the client is, whether you're representing case one, no one knows, or case two, join the juice, I would like you guys to sort of discuss in the groups what do we need in, and then place your initiatives uh, on the roadmap, the physical roadmap. You will get sticky tags. You'll get the initiatives, so you can place them on, physically on the roadmap. And then I would like you, when we come back, I think we can use um, half an hour for, for that. 
then uh, I would like you guys to, to come back and then uh, present the results and, uh, and share the discussions uh, that have been going on in, in your group. So I hope you guys are up for, for trying to apply uh, some of uh, the work here. So allow me to, to split you up in, uh, in four groups. And uh, I think uh, I'll just uh, take uh, you four here. You are group uh, team one, so that's the Novo Nordisk. Uh, you here, you four here, unless Matthew you want to join as well, you will be uh, team two, also representing Novo Nordisk. And then we have uh, you five here, you will be team three, representing Joe and the Jews. And the remaining group here, uh, now four, uh, representing also uh, Joe and the Jews. So if you could just send one representative from each group, then I'll give you the equipment needed for the exercise. I'll come out as well to help, you know, take some of the common areas, um, set it up, and then uh, I'll come around to, to facilitate the, the process as well. So, any questions for the exercise before we break out? All right, but then let's be back uh, quarter past, uh, what's the time now? Yeah, so in, uh, in half an hour. So one person comes down, you will get the page of the exercise. Fiat. And you will need a roadmap that I will give you. Oops. It's a little bit difficult to get out. <laughs> so take one one. What team are you? No, the first one. No more one. That's Nova 2. Yes. Yes. Perfect. And Joe and the Juice, number three. I'm very happy we didn't get Nova Nordisk. Well, there's no way they could do anything. We will see. We shall see. We shall see. I think we got all four. Okay, so we could on touch me not defeat. Yeah, it's too long, but it was really just in the same Engagement. All right, guys, get seated. Thank you for, for helping out these two companies. And uh, get ready also to, to present uh, your roadmap. So maybe we could have uh, team one first, Novo Nordisk, team one, come and uh, present your roadmap, give the, the arguments. What did you choose? What did you not choose? And does it add up as well? Uh, do you have some weeks left or, or what? Yeah. So, running pilots and so on. 
Great. And then you have one week to oh, we have one week buffer. <laughs> well, thank you to team one. Team two. How many weeks does it all add up to? Great. Hmm. Thank you very much to team two. Also clap to team one. Team three. <laughs> team three. Who would like to come up and present on behalf of team three? try to add it up but uh, <laughs> thank you to team three we're well over the 12 weeks I would say five, five weeks over so um, maybe we should take one or two initiatives out all right team one team four can you hold this for a moment I'll get some more sticky tag
second week, uh, we decided upon making a team tap. Uh, I will start our session with Juice. Uh, see many outputs for the needs. Uh, this guy is going to make the best money, but, uh, but it's very important to target what we want to achieve. So that's also uh, what we decided to do after. Uh, third week, of course, being a small organization, you need to know what internal capabilities uh, you have. So that would be our, our third choice. Uh, after we've kind of mapped uh, what resources we have, um, the project should have uh, technical guidelines in order to identify more bottlenecks or even uh, new potential opportunities. And lastly, of course, uh, we had a agreed on an operating model, so we know what the stages of the, this project uh, should look like. And I know from a consulting point of view, it's not good to finish necessarily early, considering the variables, but we finished in 11 weeks. All right. Thank you to Team 4. Well done. And uh, I know it's a pretty difficult exercise because, and that's actually the whole exercise. How do we prioritize? What do we do? How long time does it take? And of course, this doesn't reflect real life because some of you also said, ah, it can't be done in Illinois within, within 12 weeks and so on. So let me just give you a flavor of what actually happened uh, at those two uh, specific companies. So Novo Nordisk, these are what uh, we used uh, for, for rolling out the, the solutions. We did the end-to-end -end playbook. I think some of you also uh, had that. Uh, the adoption playbook, operating model, sense of excellence, and, and so on. We didn't spend 12 weeks. We spent 20 months. So you guys were much better than us <laughs> in, in doing it. And um, there were some obstacles, definitely. And just by rolling out to 36 uh, affiliates, or how much it was, uh, it just was a hurdle. Uh, because every affiliate was unique. We need to mature that uh, you know we had the same definitions, market definitions, and so on, that we were comparing apples with apples. So it was just a huge process uh, to do it. It was more easier for the last remaining 10 affiliates, but uh, it actually took some time. It took quite a long time, to, to be quite honest. But the solution went live, actually, just uh, two, two months ago with the uh, remaining countries. And now the, the program uh, has, uh, has uh, concluded successfully. So, so that's, um, that was a good thing. John the Juice, on the other hand, well, we spent just around 10 weeks, so a little bit less than those 12 weeks. And the main things that we brought into play were actually the change map, the adoption playbook, and the center of excellence. And uh, what we built there for them was this uh, profit and loss reports and trying to, you know, closely working with the, with the leadership team uh, and trying to give them some, some new insights. I think if I should just pick one insight out uh, from, from what we learned from all the data that they have, was there is a significant difference of how many processed uh, items they could go through, so from, from the juicers. So if you had seven months of experience, you could process 2.1 more items within the hour compared to those who had you know, four months of experience. So then you can ask yourself 2.1 uh, order items, you know, one juice, one sandwich, that's it. Um, they have a POS point of sale system. Uh, so at all the, the juice bars, so they could see how much items are being processed. Uh, so that's uh, something that they're bringing up as one of their core systems or one of their yeah, source systems. So that is collect, uh, collected uh, real time. Uh, they're using, a, now it's getting a little bit technical, but a AWS, S, uh, Amazon Web Service uh, Redshift setup. And then they're reporting on, on Power BI. But what was interesting was, so these guys uh, that, that have just two, three more uh, months more experience, they could process 2.1 more order items. What they could also see is uh, they've been heavily hit during COVID-19 because it was closed down and so on. They will also see where could we expect uh, to get the most sales, uh, which uh, juice bars are performing the best. Should we open in one big bang or should we sort of try to target um, uh, which juice bars to open first? But coming back to the experience, um, what's the biggest uh, sort of uh, obstacle to, to going in a, in a juice bar when you go in a, in a juice? The queue. the queue, exactly. So if you see a queue, then you don't go in. And that's why those 2.1 order items more 
it, it has those ripple effects because if you can process more, the queue gets shorter. Of course, you can also, you're more efficient and so on. So the ripple effects are insane when it comes to the bigger picture. And that's why they said, okay, just by this, that one insight, we need to know, we need to keep the juicers. It's, they're not performing at their optimal from four months, but seven months. Then there, there's an immediate effect. So um, yes, this, these are some of the tools uh, that we did, so the, the solution that we built, and uh, primary to, to the leadership team. Great. So as a, as a consultant, we sort of need to wrap up. So what are the three uh, key takeaways that we, that we have taken from, from today's session that I hope that you guys have taken? Is uh, I hope you've sort of uh, got to the conclusion as well that leaders they drive digital development by, by climbing this maturity curve, a framework that, you, that was introduced. You have seen where sort of multinational companies like No Noise, they, they might suffer from complexities. Uh, SMEs might suffer from these resource constraints. And then you've practiced on yourselves these digital initiatives, how they should be prioritized based on certain organizational characteristics. So that was actually the concluding words from, from here. I hope you enjoyed it. And uh, any last final questions before we, we might head off to, to the, the drinks or, and a little bit to, to eat? And you're absolutely right. So they leveraged the, the lockdown to, to launch their app, the Joe and Juice app, and to track more customer. They wanted to say, that's why they were giving, you know, come to our app, you get a 15% discount. They have this uh, um, scoring system as well. The more you buy, the more you, now you're on the purple stage, and uh, now you're in this juice level. So they leveraged the time around that we're closing down just to, you know, get up on the digital transformation curve. And actually, they are working with, with data on where should we open our next shop. And what's impressive with Joe and the Juice, they hit it with 1% accuracy. They can hit what we will hit in, uh, when there's not a COVID-19, but then we, can, then we can hit with 99% accuracy of how much our revenue will be within that first year uh, of the shop opening. So they're actually really, really good at it. All right. Thank you very much for your time, your participation.